Now I'm going to hand over to Danielle. Welcome. And the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I have a lawnmower situation, so there might be a few seconds here and there when it gets really loud, um, but I will try to <laughs> work around that. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can keep stay on track. Can everybody see that? Perfect. Um, okay, so thank you for having me here at Life Itself and for this opportunity to kind of share what I've been doing the last year and a half or two years or so. Um, year and a half. Um, when Lauren asked me like maybe a month and a half ago or whatever to present on this, I had to come up with a paragraph and, and what I was going to talk about. And so that's when I had the title from Field Survey to Limicon and Beyond. And my idea was to kind of talk about my journey into this space and then the field study and then Limicon in kind of a progressive kind of view. Um, and I since then have dug into the Life Itself community and um, what, what's been going on there with transdisciplinarity and second the second renaissance field deliberately developmental spaces and the um paper that i found that really kind of got me excited was the emergent power paper um so in that paper um it talks about what inner capacities do change agents in the emerging ecosystem need to develop so that the ecosystem becomes more powerful and better able to contribute to life-serving socio-ecological transformation so that's from that paper um, and i had kind of my own version of that that idea um, mine was how do i develop my potential by living my calling while working with other people in service to the community slash ecosystem slash field slash world and how does the ecosystem support me so i found a, a real synergy with that emergent paper um, and so i thought as i looked at kind of how i was organizing the the talk and how it might tie to the life itself community um, was when i look at my journey it really was um, into this space I really think it's like a case study for emergent, like for an emergently led change agent who's coming into this space. And so as I was reading that paper and kind of seeing my own um, experiences, I've tried to highlight kind of throughout my presentation in blue, different things that I was learning or thinking or, or developing capacities as I was kind of going through the process. Um, as I talk about the field, I, I think um, how our research missions might be similar or different, and how um, can our perspectives during these different field building processes that we've done, like how can we use those to find our edges and then collaborate on future research? And then looking at Limicon and how we kind of designed Limicon as an emergent space and a deliberately developmental space, how can we use Limicon as a case study? And then also, what are the possibilities of the future of Limicon and how might life itself, how might the life itself community kind of participate in, in whatever those future phases look like? So just some of the questions that might be relevant here. And I'm open to um, kind of questions throughout or kind of saying everything and then presenting it. So if something's burning, um, feel free to, to ask. Okay, so the about me thing. And I, I went and I made the mistake of um, watching Isabella's community call before this and um, <laughs> and seeing seeing um, like her about me page and this is kind of where imposter syndrome comes into this thing because um, <laughs> no no it's perfect it's perfect so so I kind of look at these resumes of all these people and I and I go I'm an imposter like that's something I've really struggled with as, as on my way in here and I look at like yeah I was fired from corporate America and you know, I spent 15 years in grad school with like no publications and no grants and <laughs> um, I got stuck in the nonprofit world and I've never been in a monastery or 
studied meditation with a great master from India. Uh, I feel like I have big energy. Um, and so sometimes that makes me self-conscious in this space. And I'm from a real small town. I'm kind of a redneck. So um, <laughs> that also makes me feel like I'm an imposter. Um, but as I've worked through that, one of the things that I've learned is like, that's just one story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying not to be emotional in this space, but um, I am. Um, so that's just one of my stories. Um, there's ways in which I'm not an imposter and ways that I fit in like here perfectly. Anyhow, just to say that all of you is welcome in this call, so please just be present with yourself. <laughs> I know, thank you. <laughs> um, in grad school, I studied curiosity and lifelong learning and positive psychology and flow and creativity. And I, I see a lot of the things that I was learning there or exploring there, like deeply relevant to, to some of the stuff that we talk about in this space and in the liminal space in general. Um, my life has been dedicated to psychological development. Like one of the first like real books I read was Sigmund Freud's Interpretation of Dreams. And I just, I was like 13 years old and I don't even really think I understood it, but I, it was just, and I was up in the UP, like I don't even know how I got a hold of that book, you know what I mean? But like, um, I was just always fascinated with, with the study of psychological development and within myself and the people around me and um, grew up in a really small town, which makes me a redneck, but also like I have those values and the trust and the kind of experience of what that's like. Um, I've had a transcendental experience with a worm. Um, I developed my own unified theory of psychology, which is one of the reasons why I didn't make it in grad school was because that idea was like not really <laughs> cool there. <laughs> um, I chose my life's work over money. Um, I don't even think because I'm noble just because like I can't do it the other way. Um, and I love to go meta and I love to go deep. And so that's why I feel like I'm not an imposter in this space. But also, I think there's some ways that I am an imposter in this space and where that's okay. Like, I think there's some ways where it's okay that I'm not the person that goes and like schmoozes with the president or whatever. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, because I'm the person who like bridges. Um, and, um, that's important too. So, and I also feel like for me, um, the the liminal web has been a deliberately developmental space. And I know it's not a physical location, and I can give you examples of those. But this is one of the um, activities that I was led in as Limicons deliberately. Like we explicitly said, Limicon was deliberately developmental for the core planning team. Um, and so one of the activities. Narayan kind of helped me through as I was like, why would anybody help me? Or why does anybody want to be here? Like kind of looking at all of the people that were kind of supporting Danielle towards this vision of Limicon um, with the idea of the bridge in mind and, and the field in mind too. So um, yeah, I, I think the whole space was deliberately developmental. So one of my like my kind of first project in the space when I decided like how do I get involved was the field study and that really started at Emerge Austin and again I feel like an imposter at Emerge Austin I'm like at the edge of town like the only hotel I can afford is like way out and it's like real sketchy part of town it's like a 20 minute uber ride there and like I can't afford to go to the dinner and I don't really know anybody so I don't get invited to the dinner for free you know what I mean like the, the fancy kind of dinner um I, I, I started to feel like these sessions aren't about me or like my people. We were talking about like wisdom and stuff, but I was more interested in like living wisdom. Um, I didn't know who like these really important people were. Like I remember it was like me and Tucker were talking and Forrest Landry walks up and Tucker's like, oh, Forrest Landry, like your work is so important or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. Sorry. Like, and just like people were like the future thinkers are here and I'm like I don't know those like so 
and then like just little things like I have trouble with new food and so everything was like vegan and spicy and just and I it it was just hard um so um but there was something about kind of like what the collective was doing in that space that really excited me and I remember um on the last day we were in a small group and and I don't even remember what the main topic was but I really kind of like let it out like there was some like how is this going to help the people and I was working in the Department of Juvenile Justice in Illinois at that time and I'm like how does what we're doing here like help them because they want to live on regenerative farms too like I talked to them about it and not all of them you know what I mean but some of them do and like what can we do about that um and um, it was at that time that like Eric Reynolds and um, Adam Wright from um, TLR invited me to kind of a, a space um, in Austin. They had a house there that they were kind of talking about. And I remember even telling my Uber driver on the way over about Emerge and about like building a field and like getting really excited about kind of that possibility. Um, and I left after the TLR house um, that night after meeting those people and kind of talking about it going like really like what can I do in this space like I, like what does that look like so there was two ways that I got involved so one was um, after Emerge Austin there was a group that got together that started planning Emerge Toronto and this was the energy was kind of driven by layman um, Toronto kind of TLR kind of took up the the mantle there and and project managed by Adam of TLR. And we were looking at what could we improve upon after Austin. And so part of the focus was kind of the Toronto attractor or this, this group or feel in Toronto where we're kind of seeing a cluster of um, people in this space in Toronto. Part of it was around funding. Um, part of it was around the field study. Part of it was around building more community and then um, also incorporating ideas of Gebser and decolonization. And so how do we kind of improve on Austin with the same idea and then incorporate some of these new things? And I really, um, I didn't really know it, but like people were developing me in, in the space um, and offering opportunities for leadership roles and that type of thing. So I, I was able to kind of step into it there. At the same time, I was also working with transdisciplinary leadership review um, and, and looking at their ideas for field building. And so I had weekly meetings with Adam Wright where um, he really, I mean, coached me basically kind of in a lot of things. Um, support from Turquoise Sound, this, this article called How Field Catalysts Gavinize Social Change just really sparked in me. Um, I was also int introduced to the Partec Incubator, so I got a little bit of funding to work on the field study through there, and then um, Clubhouse sessions, the TLR Clubhouse. And um, it, at that point, it was really this kind of "this is what I'm supposed to do" type of type of feeling. Um, so I followed that, and so you know, my first iteration of kind of trying to put all of the different parts of the field together, you know, my title was stealing the culture by transforming game A into an integral society after building a meta modern field of praxis during a time between worlds, because we want to weather the poly meta crisis through emergent processes. <laughs> and that was me just trying to kind of figure out how all the pieces fit together. And then um, really dug into the series of um, essays that Jonathan Rousen wrote, kind of framing the Emerge gathering, where he talked about field building and um, looking at kind of the strong field framework that he mentioned in that and um, kind of coming up with this um, first iteration of the field study, but also kind of struggling with this, like how much structure do we want? Like if the goal is emergence, I just remember really kind of struggling back and forth between this kind of like structure and um, not having control, like like where you want a little bit and where you want too much and, and really kind of trying to process that at the time. So I won't go through all these, but just some of the questions kind of that first iteration had. And so then um, kind of through my work with TLR 
and beyond the strong field, you know, um, Turquoise and Adam were constantly kind of sending me different ideas and places. And um, I got into like impact networks and Carol Sanford work, work and Adrian Marie Brown on emergence and looked at, you know, just field building, but then also ecosystem building and community building and network building and movement building and kind of all of the different similarities between that. Um, I know there was a point where I kind of looked at the work that life itself had on there and there was others I, with mapping projects and things and then Robert Keegan. Um, and these are just some of the kind of new things I was introduced to in that in that space. Um, and so when I was looking at it, there was kind of these kind of traditional ways to define a field and it was like, okay, well, depending on who our audience is, this is, um, you know, when we're looking at like a field of business. This is kind of the way, but then also feeling really drawn towards Carol Sanford's idea of field and, um, you know, kind of looking at it like the game A version and the game B version of what a field is and, and what the possibilities are there. And so at this point, it's now called the liminal landscape survey, as I've <laughs> tried to feel like is a field the right word? What's the right word? So I started collecting data in April of 2023. Um, I, one of my first interviews was a live interview of Lehman at the Meta Modern Spirituality Retreat in Vermont um, in May that year. I, I connected with a few more liminal individuals in the space and then also really wanted to kind of bridge the layman into this and so did um, about 15 interviews with people in the um, Chicago land area to kind of bridge, like, like my passion really is to how do we, how do we connect those two worlds. Um, and again, as I'm going through this, this, this project is, you know, the vehicle that I'm using to, to help me develop, you know, it's the thing that's triggering me and, and causing like tensions and conflicts. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing all these um, past triggers and belongingness issues and money issues and leaning into the pain. And those are some of the lessons I'm learning at this time. So then um, the, the problem that I was running into was kind of how do we define the sample? Like who's in and who's out? And it, it, was, it, it was, and I see kind of as I'm reading the research that you put out, like that's been a struggle in the life itself community a little bit as well. Um, and so what happened was um, the Emerge Toronto gathering was not gonna happen in person that year. And so the, the team decided to pivot to an online type of gathering um, kind of as a placeholder until the next Emerge uh, North America gathering could happen. And um, yeah, so when that work came about, it, it kind of that work and the field survey work kind of clicked together for me. And I felt like I was kind of ready to take on a new level of responsibility and a new challenge in learning that was kind of at the edge of my limits. And so, um, and then also it was one of those things where it just, again, felt like what I was supposed to do. And even if I did it badly, I was supposed to say like, I will lead this because like the process of me leading it would be important in some way. Um, so that's really kind of what I stepped into when I sent Adam and Turquoise and Layman like this board that I made and this, like 10 minute um, video recording of like, okay, here's what um, Limicon 2024 might look like after we had kind of brainstormed as a group to, to um, what kind of the vibe of it might be. And so it was really for me bringing in this landscape survey, like, like this would be a way for um, people to opt in to say, yes, I am part of this community or, or part of whatever this, this vision is. Um, there would be different types of topics. We would include ex, um, different people, spectators. And so th that kind of merged into this bigger plan for this, where we would have this container with a diff all kinds of different sessions. There was the next wave of people who could watch, who could spectate um, if they wanted to. There was a kind of meta sense of debriefing and looking at oops, the container as, as a whole um, as part of this kind of field survey thing. 
And then there were these artifacts of these kind of collective intelligence artifacts that would come out of it. Um, so this is kind of the original concept of it. And, and the thing I'm working on at this time is kind of this go fast to, or go slow to go fast and kind of tempering this, wanting to kind of go all in on it, but also feeling this, this pullback and, and wrestling with what that might be. And so Adam and Lehman kind of bring in this idea of convention and fun and Matt um, Frenario Mara brings in this idea of deep listening and grief for, as important concepts for emergence. And then there's a bunch of obstacles. <laughs> like, how do we deal with money? That tends to be an obstacle. Like, how do you lead teams? I, I like blow up a couple of teams in the process. Um, really kind of fighting for it to be a non-egoic event and and really wanting to kind of maintain kind of this spirit of co-creation and that the edges are welcome and that type of thing and then just my own personal insecurities and areas that i needed to clean up um and you know kind of viewing this process as everything is a lesson the synchronicities got to be a little much at time like the learning would be so intense sometimes it got a little like jarring um but it was really kind of this process allowing me to lean into my edges and, and kind of tweak those things that needed to be worked on. And so then in about the end of October, um, Phil and Narayan enter, enter the, the domain of Limicon. And what they brought into the space was really kind of this experience and enthusiasm for co-creation, for, um, deliberately developmental spaces. So they were really like, yes, let's use this as a process where we can watch ourselves in the process and, and push our edges. And um, it felt right that they were both in Toronto and that still being an important part of the project. Um, I had spoken to Narayan earlier in the year about kind of the mapping work that he does and the social systems maps that he looks at. And I just thought, I made my own personal map and just kind of saw the, the future of possibilities of what that could look like. And so was really excited about those types of things. Phil's EGP process that he worked on seemed like a really cool way to kind of find out what, what we wanted as a whole, as a group. Um, and yeah, just lots of facilitation skills and just being committed to relationships and, and um, there was just a lot of a lot of synergies um, within our team. So kind of our aspirations for Limicon were just we provide simple rules and structures. Uh, we invite a bunch of diverse parts to the space and then we have kind of this orient orienting beacon for participants and that was um, this this thing that this oops saying that's on the Board, we find ourselves in a liminal space between worlds, entrenched in a meta crisis, and embedded in cultural systems that are inadequate for regenerative future civilization. We are the people living the question how do we become the humans we need to be, both individually and collectively, to be in service to hospicing the old systems and midwifing the new systems that are emerging? And again, a mouthful, but it, it really needed to be like that to capture all the different parts. And it was like, okay, well, Whoever identifies as that, <laughs> that's, that's um, who the field is. Okay, so some of the tools that we use, the, the simple structures that we used, we had a mirror board, and this is a general overview, but if you, you could, I can't do it, but you can scroll in and each of these um, small things, this is basically like an online whiteboard. So each of these is an area of maybe like a different session where people could put notes up, um, they could add to the schedule, they could, you know, there's like a area for a playlist and there's different areas for different parts of the world. Um, and again, we didn't, uh, we can talk about maybe some of the places where we didn't hit the mark, like as far as, um, I, I might've wanted to see it, but, um, I'm, I'm just kind of describing what the tools are right now. So, yeah, so there was this place where people, and the idea is to, to gather the collective intelligence, to allow people to go here and kind of add the things that they know to the space. We also had a social systems network map, and it's hard to kind of see the connections here, but when you break out of it on the map, you can filter by a bunch of different categories that we had people fill out. We had the EGPs, 
And so the questions for those, we talked about what's the shadow of Limicon with the idea being that in fractal, fractal nature, that would be the, the shadow of um, many different levels. Um, what's the path to a liminal network state? How do we make a meta modern business bureau? And what's the next phase of Limicon? And that one was or originally religion, but as the kind of time got through, um, Phil decided like that, that was something that was coming up more. And so these were processes to understand, to, to kind of take the pulse and understand what was important and what people within the whole field were valuing. And then the, the, the different sessions. So we provided a Google calendar and there was a, a short form you could fill out. That form then uploaded the, um, the sessions into a calendar. We asked people to present what's, who's gonna host it, what's the vibe of the space, some basic kind of restrictions of the space, like not restrictions, I guess, but like agreements of the space. Is it gonna be recorded? Is the camera gonna be on? Can I come in and just watch? So just so people kind of knew what they were walking into and the level of participation. And then um, a link to the event. So most people provided their own links to the event. We started at first to, we were gonna provide links, but then that got really hard <laughs> real fast as we started, as a lot of the sessions started. So we ended up having 147 total online sessions. And I just took a, a cut of one of the um, parts of the boards just to kind of give people an idea of some of the different types of sessions that were offered. And then there were also some kind of hangouts or hybrid or in-person type events. <clears throat> so what were some of the outcomes of Limicon? I think um, the people on the edges some of those people talked. So I know a lot of people kind of felt because it was a little bit more low key and not like, oh, this is a big formal conference type experience that there were some people who presented things that they wouldn't normally have talked about that they felt they could either be a little more experimental or that they could be um, a little more daring in the space because it, it felt like that. Um, I think we heard from quite a few people that it, it it helped them to feel less alone, that it was like, oh yeah, there's other people like me out here in this world. I'm, I'm meeting these people now, this is great. Um, we don't have all the data in yet, but we, do, we did see the initial kind of forming of some um, project partners within the space. Uh, we saw people practice skills and have opportunities to grow throughout the space, not just the core team as we planned it, but Kind of everybody. Um, people made new friends. People got to share their stories. That was another thing that a that several people kind of voiced as being important to them was just having a place where they could share a story that they hadn't been able to share anywhere else uh, before um, felt important to them. And I think overall, um, the field got a jolt, <laughs> got a little jolt of energy that that um, alivened it a little, and um, helped it see itself a little bit. And um, we'll see, we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> so what's next as far as Limicon goes? So right now we are tending to some core team relationship stuff. Um, we found that as a team, kind of our core team of three, and then also um, kind of throughout the process as, as a way for me to kind of have well, I don't know why, to, to help navigate another situation like um, Lauren came into kind of our core team dynamic and Lauren was in charge of most of, uh, a great deal of the logistical stuff that happened at Limicon and really helped to kind of tighten that up and make it a, a playground that that people could, could navigate pretty easy. Um, so kind of looking at those dynamics and some of the edges that were, the differences and tensions that we're experiencing there. Um, Kind of analyzing the data of Limicon, like what did we learn from the experience? What did we learn ourselves? What kind of collectively came out of that? Um, perhaps do some follow-up interviews or at least some follow-up conversations with people and then think about decisions on what the next iteration of Limicon looks like or what does, what does that energy coming out of Limicon become? Um, and then kind of for me, I, I'm kind of interested in how do we take some of the North American findings on 
the field study work that's been going and, and expand that to North America and, and how um, that might look. And then, you know, wondering if kind of a series of pop-up fields and training people to, to kind of be the experts in their fields are, might be like one road to kind of this, the second Renaissance um, in that, in that space. So, so yeah, that's what I got and I'm, open to questions or chatting or whatever comes next. Thank you so much, Danielle. Yes, let's open out for people's reflections, comments, questions. Does anybody have anything that they would like to jump in with? You can just unmute yourselves and, and take over, it's fine. Yeah, I'm curious, Daniel. How did you decide on a whole freaking month? And what has the experience been with that? Has it been like thousand months, or if you were to do it again, would it be same time frame? I think when I started to look at. the the nature of what we wanted it to be um having it be a month seemed more flexible because you didn't have to you know we were getting closer to the date and you didn't have to then say okay everybody needs to be available on this date it was now here's four weeks sometime in that four weeks throw a session up and so it was a lot like it, it kind of created that more relaxed vibe versus like okay we have these many days to get these many sessions in um, so for me, that's when I was kind of originally looking at it, that's, that felt like a way to kind of handle that tension of trying to pack everything in in two days or getting everybody, finding two days that everybody was available or, or those types of things. Um, and, and we had toyed with the idea of kind of making themes for different weeks and, and guiding it a little more than we did. And we didn't do that, I think, more because we ran out of time in the space, but I, I think it might have been better to have it more open. Like, I think it kind of created its own vibe throughout the month um, and didn't need some of those, you know, orientation week and debrief week and, and some of those types of things. But that was a consideration that we had in the process. Hands in. Your hands up. Oh, actually, Rufus had his hand up before me. I'm not sure. Um, I will let Rufus go if he'd like to, and then. Rufus, did you have your hand up? I don't think. I think I was clapping. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll ask my question, and then you know, obviously, other people maybe have questions as well. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, actually, uh. I think it was really amazing how many events there were like every day people were just there was so much energy you know uh like i don't think there was a single day in that month where there wasn't an event right and there were some of them were like kind of concurrent and like um i know that every session i went to there were several people there i'm not sure if there were you know some that like there were you know not many people showed up for there could have been you know because there were like a hundred something events um and well it just it makes me wonder like um remember how the stoa and rebel wisdom they had curated public events uh, especially the stoa over the course of like what three years uh peter Lindbergh would curate those events um uh like a couple per week on average i think and uh, and then he would do the work to edit the videos and upload them, you know, to uh, his YouTube channel. And I know that the community could support that, you know, um, to have someone or maybe a small committee curate events to have regularly every week. Um, and then like, like once a year, have a big Limicon thing where it's all, you know, free for all. <laughs> Uh, so is there any thought of, of doing something like that? I don't have a lot of familiarity with 
the Stoa stuff before. I mean, I've watched videos on YouTube, but I don't, I, I've heard a lot about the community and I haven't learned as much as I should about that kind of early Stoa stuff. Um, I, and I don't know that I exactly understand what you're asking, um, but there, there are talks about what the future of Limicon looks like, if that is the question. Yeah, well, I, I, what I was fe feeling with Limicon is it was like a, a rebirth of that Stoa vibe. Uh, but then like to say, I, w I wouldn't imagine you'd want something like that to on to go on, you know, like it's a special thing, like to have any the whole community be able to put events on the calendar over the course of, you know, this a month. But uh, I think that somehow there could be uh, someone to say, OK, you can submit me ideas and I'll maybe put it up and have a, a public website, a public website. That's what, that's pretty much just what the SOA was. It's like, you know, we're doing these events on these dates at these times. Um, and, you know, there might have been other ideas that came in, but you have a filter somehow. And then it happens every week, you know, like maybe once a week, there's some sort of event, you know. So that's a way to keep the energy going and then uh occasionally as you know like maybe once a month you'd have the limicon which would be like now we're really doing it i don't know that's just that's a suggestion to bring you know to to continue no no i i the one thing i think that there is something kind of like this in uh emergent commons where they do have regular events but you have to like join their thing to see that calendar you know so uh, I know that, you know, with the, with this, the way the Stoa worked is that there was, it was public on a website, you know, here's the link and you could just join. You didn't have to join like a social network or anything to see it. But the difference was the Stoa was run by one person and he decided what came on the calendar. This is totally different. Like you host a space where anyone actually can host something so you need a very much more identity of what is it that you want or not because it's pretty open but it's not totally open it's not about the football or whatever yeah <laughs> so, um, and my question is like you talked at the end about field experts and training do you have an idea about what what you actually mean by that what, who would be a field expert what what what's the job what's what do you have in mind um well that was kind of a big vision goal like that's that's a very big vision but in my brain it's like if we if there's a new field of deliberately developmental spaces and a new field of emergent leaders and a new field of, you know what I mean? Like it, it's pretty easy to, pretty easy to like create a field and create a journal and create, you know what I mean? And, and we could simultaneously be training deliberately developmental coaches and then create the next big field. And then, I don't know, like, if we're looking at how to usher in the second renaissance, that was kind of my offering for that <laughs> big question, I guess, or one of my ideas, I guess. Kind of leads into my question a bit, which is, um, which is what were the themes? You said you were playing with the idea of, of maybe themes of some sort. And I was curious about what themes you were toying with, partly because I'm I'm involved, I'm helping to, um, I was helping to curate a list and develop a list of themes for um, the gathering of tribes in September in in, uh, in Portugal, uh, which is obviously a, an in-person event rather than an online event. But um, the idea being that if you can identify really a separate, a, a whole lot of different particular themes, then people can actually come together on those themes. And indeed, on the key live questions within those themes. 
So I was just curious about that. If you had, if you had any, any thoughts about either what the themes might have been or how you would actually develop them. So we went through a couple iterations, and at the beginning, it was around kind of the same way emerged it around topics, so like Web three or education or kind of those types of themes. Um, then there was also kind of this shamanic, like, how do we bring in different energies and kind of looking at, you know, at one point we were talking about how the um, how we could come in from the winter with the with this kind of um, quietness and grief and kind of bring that into the beginning of it and have a portal ceremony at the equinox and then kind of leave with kind of a more upbeat and spirit uh, um, of hope and kind of building energy at the end of it. So that was kind of one vibe of theme that we talked about. And then there was just more kind of the first week will be about orienting to the space and then the second week will be about meeting people and then the third week will be about talking to people and then the fourth week will be about kind of a debrief so there was there was many different iterations of kind of what a, a thematic month might look like um none of them ever got really too far james yeah, and as a Limicon participant, I will say that I saw some themes. And for example, one theme was money. And I think there, there was a lot of energy and a lot of events. And I think in part it became a theme because maybe Lehman kicked it off with a you know nice big session and a provocative, you know, and then you know, five other people made five other sessions to follow on and carry that energy forward. And so I enjoyed the thread of that theme weaving itself through the emergent space. Uh, my question, Danielle, to you is about kind of going back to that curation and non-curation question a bit. Um, I remember seeing in early, you know, there was something on the mural board of like, put session ideas here. And there was something about voting or dot voting or emojis or something. And then, oh, and then the core team will put sessions on the schedule I think that was the original design. And then at some point it became, here's a form. It just goes straight to a calendar. And my experience of that was that that actually became a really core part of what made Limicon work was just the people getting inspired and then putting up their own sessions and running with it. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about your experience, Danielle, <clears throat> of, yeah, maybe going from more curated to more open space or just what was that? What was that story like for you? And you know, how much was how much was accidental or intentional or emergent and just kind of what that was like? Um I think for me, I always kind of even in the early iterations wanted it where people could basically just submit. Like there would be a little bit of monitoring, maybe, but not any sort of like gatekeeping. Um and and the voting. From my point of view, the voting for me, and I think Narayan and Phil might say something different because I think there was a, a difference point in our planning thing, but was more about like, um, one of my original ideas was really to have this kind of be a choose your own adventure type of thing so that people could put into the space. I want to see a session on this and we would do a little bit more to kind of create the sessions that people wanted to see um so a little bit more curating of sessions um and i think trying to figure out like a voting process for that is really tricky and again it was just one of those things where it was like oh that would be kind of fun to have a poll of like layman's going to give a talk on this day what what do you want to hear layman talk about you know and have everybody be able to vote um we also had some detractors from that idea that we would get voting McBoat face type um, content and that that could be a problem. Um, so, and then I think it really just came to the sense that it was easier to automate the form and it was easy, you know what I mean? Like it got to a point where there so many people started submitting and, and we just kind of said, we can't really 
control this anyway. So <laughs> let's just open it up. And so that's when the form got automated. And now it's just, here's the form, put it up there. There were a couple of times where we looked at things and went, you know, like there was one that put like cameras off and somebody put fuck you or something like that. And we were like, should we let it, we had a conversation. Should we let it go? Do we let this person? And I'm like, you know, if that's how the person wants to present themselves, then like, I guess you make a choice if you want to go to that. Cause, cause then it's about the choice as a, as a person participating too, you know, I'm just giving you all the information about my session. You can choose if you want to go to that space. So if it says that, Maybe it's better to leave that up to let people know kind of like what they're walking into in that space and, and just being really like kind of open about what the spaces are. So kind of at that point, that's what it really became like for me is just letting giving people a lot of information about what they were walking into in the space and then letting them make that choice um, and then letting people put whatever spaces they wanted to put. Now, we didn't get anything super offensive, though. So if somebody would have said porn viewing session or something, you know what I mean? We might have had to make more strict choices but um no it like i said that kind of that one instance was as far as it went does anyone else have any other comments or thoughts we've got about five six minutes left before the hour so just well, Danielle, anything you want to want to share because it's come up for you since the questions have been coming in? Yeah. I kind of want to ask, what's next for you, Danielle? Anything? Yeah, that's where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> just that's what makes it easy, I know I can do it now. Now I just have to pick. <laughs> And um, yeah, so kind of seeing what that looks like and what that means. And but, uh, like, what's going on in that because this is it feels like it's something down into the general flow, it's not too expensive. Mm -hmm. Brandon, did you have a question as well? Yeah, just one. Uh, yeah, I um, I think that uh, in, in Danielle's last uh, you know, answer there, um sort of answered my question before I even asked it, which is like, what are the, you know, um, things that uh, you, you're kind of learning from uh, that were like, okay, so that didn't go super perfect, you know, and it sounded like, I think actually, Danielle, you uh, and the rest of the team did an amazing job of holding the field together. Cause uh, I have to figure there are certain ways in which this could have gone, you know, off the rails like if it's not the field is not properly held together so the fact that you guys were able to do that was amazing so i'm not sure though if you have any like okay here's what we'd like to do better next time you know on the basis of you know this or that um better representation is important to me one of the things i was really interested in was the, the voices that we haven't heard a lot in the field and the voices on the edges and I think we could have, I think that could be something that next year is better that we hear more of the voices. Um, there were some spaces missing, you know, we had a lot of certain types of sessions and then not a lot of some other types of sessions. So I'd like to see a more well-rounded um, type of session. Um, I mean, there's lots of little things and, and I don't even know and I feel like I have 400 of these and I'm only, and I'm drawing a blank now that I'm <laughs> answering them right here. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I don't know. In, in some ways, there's lots of things that could be better and in some ways it was perfect. So, um, yeah. It kind of ties into the question that Rhea's asked in the chat, which was, what was your most unexpected learning or learnings? I mean, it's so stupid and it should be like the least unexpected learning, but it's like, it's hard to get people to get along and do stuff sometimes. <laughs> and like, duh, right? Like, but that was it. That was just, I, every time it's probably like, why are we fighting? And like, it would surprise me over and over again. And I, it just is silly that it did, but.
Lovely. Thank you so much, Danielle. I feel like everybody has sort of exhausted any questions that are that are available to them now. But obviously you're in our group chat. So if people want to to join the WhatsApp group link, then they can always uh, continue asking you any questions if that's all right with you. Um, so yes, thank you so much for your time and your energy and also holding the, the space for Limacon 2024 to actually happen. Um, and I've put a little note in the chat that if anybody would like to uh, host a community call or has anyone that they they think would be um, a good person for me to invite, then to drop me an email so I can reach out to them and have a chat. We we're very open about who can who can come and present as long as obviously there is is a sense of alignment for what the community um, is after. And thank you. And uh, Rufus has just kindly also added into the chat the um, information around our Get Involved initiative, which is if people want to offer up any of their, their time, their skills, their energy to our kind of ad hoc popping up uh, pieces of work that as a small team, we we often need a little bit of support with. So you can get read a bit more information there around that. And there's also a bit more information on the community as well through a link um, where you can yeah, get a, a bit of a better sense around how you can also be involved with the Life Itself community. But as always, you also have my email address so you can also reach out to me directly. So thank you all so much for attending. And um, yes, I will hopefully see you on another community call soon. Thank you so much again, Danielle. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.